be in the room that you die in. When I think of Saw, I think of naivety. I think of myself as a much younger guy who didn't really have an idea how to write films. Lee and I had a very important goal, and that is to make a movie that can break out there and cut through all the low budget indie movies that get made, you know, like every day. Somehow, you know, James and I, we, we achieved our dream. We had that great moment that unfortunately a lot of people don't get to have, where, which is where your life's dream comes true. He doesn't want us to cut through our chains. He wants us to cut through our feet. Let the game begin. My buddy Lee Winnell and I, you know, we've been, uh, we've known each other for a while. We met back at film school in college, university in Australia. And, uh, and you know, we shared very similar interests and, uh, and, you know, we, we got along really well. And then we realized that we wanted to do the same thing, which is make a feature film. Lee really wanted to uh, act and write. For me, you know, my passion has always been to direct. So, you know, we, we collaborated, we got together and, uh, you know, and we spent many years just making little short films between he and myself. And then eventually um, we decided that uh, we wanted to be noticed for a feature and we wanted to make a feature. However, we didn't want to make a feature or write a feature script and just to give it to someone else. We wanted to write something that we can hopefully make ourselves. We wanted to make a film, but we quickly realised that in Australia, it's, 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 it's a very small film industry, it's very hard to get films made, and mostly films are funded by the government to this day. We felt like we were so outside of that. We didn't know the right people, we didn't know anybody in the film industry. It, it felt like a club to us. Maybe that wasn't the way it actually was, but that was our perception. And so we decided if we were going to make a film, we'd have to make it ourselves with our own money. The thing we needed, the thing we were lacking, was a great story. And so the idea of Saw literally came about out of necessity. Uh, we wanted to make a movie with our own hard-earned cash, with our own money. And so we came up with a story about two guys trapped in one room. I went and wrote the script, and we were intending to shoot it ourselves with our own money until my agent and manager at the time, Stacey Testro, she read it and she was like, well, don't go and make this for $5,000 and screw it up. Like, let's go and try and find some real money. Let's try and find a million dollars. And so Stacy then um, got us connected with um, an agent out in LA uh, who had read the script and really loved it and wanted to meet up with Lee and myself. And that's when we made the short. The, the short is really just one scene from the movie. It's like a demo reel and use that short film to showcase myself as a filmmaker and to showcase Lee as an actor. And we did that so that when we came here to LA, we could say, hey, here's the script and here's one scene from the movie. This is what it would look like. And so it, it wasn't really made as a short film that we could put into festivals or anything. It was just made for this specific purpose of getting the film funded. And people just loved the short. I mean, they really liked the script, but the short just instantly communicated what the film was. It was beautifully shot. I mean, you could already tell uh, this beautiful vision that, that James had. And they borrowed the money to, to, to shoot the scene from family and friends. So I already knew how passionate they were about the film. And they, they just, uh, it was just incredible, incredible to see these two young filmmakers with, a, with such a unique vision. Greg Hoffman was our partner who's passed away was actually taking meetings looking for some TV projects and uh, an agent said you know you got to see something there's something that's really cool and they actually have a script and they showed Greg the seven-minute tape and he's like whoa 
So he thought it was pretty cool. He came back to Evolution and he grabbed Mark and I and went to my office. We popped it in and the three of us watched it. And it was pretty cool, it was interesting. It was a little bit, reminded me of a early 2000s, late 90s, like a tool, you know, those industrial videos. We said, okay, we made three copies of the script and went home and read it and came back the next day and thought, this is something really cool, there's something to it. And they go, we want to make this movie. We don't have a lot of money to make it, but you guys can come and play with us on it. You can direct it, James and Lee. You can act in it. Let's go and make this film. As soon as we said yes to them, we were shooting within a couple of months. That's how quickly the turnaround was. Lionsgate got involved pretty early on. Um, I think they got involved um, um, during the pre-production stage. My producers, they had approached um, different studios to see if they'd be interested in this project. And, um, and you know, and there were a bunch of people that were actually quite excited about it, but, um, but Lionsgate were just very gun-ho about it. They really got the film. They were very excited. Um, Peter Block and Jason Constantine were the two guys that I dealt with um, the most, and they were basically, you know, like um, our um, partners in making these films. <laughs> We had an immediate visceral reaction to what James and Lee were wanting to do and what Mark and Oren and Greg Hoffman had really, really responded to. And I, so and ironically, I think in many ways, what got the film made was our enthusiasm. What, what made the deal hard uh, in terms of getting the film made was our, our enthusiasm. Because the moment we said, <laughs> we definitely want to do this, is the moment they said, well, wait a second. <laughs> Let's talk about how the split will be. Um, and that was, that was always the thing. <laughs> I, I constantly go back and think, Wish I had done that a little differently, you know. Unbridled enthusiasm cuts both ways. But the great thing about the script is, you know, and, and a lot of the projects we were doing at the time is, you know, we had this mantra like, you know, if you can find the moment where the audience says, oh, that's just wrong, at least you know you have something in, you know, the audience will react to and, and the, the press will write about, right? And, you know, we'll continue, you know, that legacy and, and give it a lifespan beyond just the initial release of the film. And Saw was chock full of those moments. If you do not kill Adam by six, and Allison and Diana will die, Dr. Gordon. And I'll leave you in this room to rot. Arne and myself had a management company, and uh, we went to a bunch of our clients to try and get them to be in the movie. And that's where Danny Glover came in and Carrie Elways. You know, my actors helped me elevate my film, you know, in the eyes of the general public. And so, uh, and so it doesn't just feel like a niche sort of horror film, and so really was that. You know, the fact that we had um, Carrie Elwes, the amazing Carrie Elwes, Denny Glover, Monica Potter, Michael Emerson, and, uh, and Tobin Bell, it was a really great cast, you know. It was a cast that um, for, you know, a first time director for a kid, you know, it was the most amazing thing, you know. I was like, oh my God, I get to work with Denny Glover and I get to work with Mr. Elwes, Mr. Prince's Bride. And so, uh, so th these were actors that I really looked up to over the years. And so, you know, um, the chance to work with them in my first movie was very exciting. I'm so thankful to people like Kerry, who was such an established actor, but such a gentleman. He never made us feel like we were working with somebody who made so many films that, that we, these crazy, naive kids, should learn from him or that we didn't know what we were doing. If anything, he made us feel like he was learning from us. He would say to us all the time, oh, I don't, I don't know the horror genre. You guys know the genre. You teach me. Which I think was just his nobility and his, his uh, generous nature. I don't think he really needed to learn from us. I think he was just being generous. And that's just Kerry. That's just who he is as a guy. A good look on you. <laughs> Thank you. This is the new fall collection. Working with James and Lee was really fun. They have wonderful senses of humor, both of them, uh, which I always love working with people who have a sense of humor. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a dark movie. It was a dark topic. You know, we were chained to the wall for a long period of time, both Lee and I. and. Uh, you know, we had to time our bathroom breaks very, very carefully. But I already knew, when I first met them, I already knew how passionate they were about the movie and how, how James's unique vision for the film was, was just, it just blew me away. Shawnee Smith came in, she was 
sicker than a dog. She could barely stand up. And we're like, she, she tried to back out of the deal. She didn't want to do it. And we're like, no, 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 we, we need you for, for literally three hours. They called me into the office to watch. This was the one scene that they had filmed to get the movie made. And Lee played my part. And so I came in the big conference room, all these guys sitting around the table, and they showed me this film. And I felt like, you know, um, the bell of the ball. And <laughs> it's like my Cinderella moment. <laughs> OK, I'll do it. Shawnee, everyone knows James had a big crush on Shawnee for a long time, so he's happy to work with her. I think the roles in horror movies come to me because they know I'll really like play the hell out of them because I get I, I that stuff trips me out. I woke up. All I could taste was blood mm. and metal. The fun memories from the traps. <laughs> Let's see. The reverse bear trap was the thing that I wanted to work on more than anything. I did, that was, that really, really had me. And uh, the problems with it was it was so heavy and so mechanical. And uh, so we had to come up with something else. After we looked at this picture of the original one that they did in Australia that, that this movie was based on, and seeing that it was too big and everything, Julie, the production designer, came up with these concept drawings of what she thought it should look like with screws and nails and sharp points and everything. Because there was no budget, right? So the, the head contraption, the jaw trap was like really heavy. And I had to hold it with a tongue depressor in my teeth. Shawnee had like 102 temperature that day. I and mean, she was just had this horrible, horrible fever. I mean, she barely could stand that day. I mean, I really was concerned. And then we're throwing this big head trap on her and she's got to scream. I think like any good actor, they just took what they had, which was I'm sick and I feel like crap, and use it. I mean, especially since she's got to cut somebody open and dig through blood and guts. There's no halfway with me either. Like, just take it all the way or I won't do it. So I was just thrashing around. There's no other way to do that except to, you know, throw your wavels to the wall and like front a punk rock band. You know, there's just no other way to do that. This is the original, the one and only reverse bear trap. It still has Shawnee's hair stuck in it. And the thing is made out of aluminum to keep it nice and light so it isn't steel like the one that they had originally on Lee's head. This is the actual air cylinder that makes the mask open up real quick with nitrogen. And uh, the gears that are on this thing are from bicycle. I just took a bicycle gears apart and put it on it and stuff. And just put other parts on it that I, I found, little knobs and whatnot and everything. And then the whole thing was painted to look rusty and stuff. Before Saw, I've worked on so many different horror movies and, you know, horror and gore and explosions and bullet hits and everything else. Then I come across this thing and it's all about these torture devices. That's the horror to this thing, these torture devices. And it was like, oh my God, I, I can make some creepy shit like this. So, you know, the whole drills coming towards the guy's head and, and everything else and the shotguns with the line attached to him where the guy goes through the line and he gets shot with all these shotguns. Man, it was disgusting. It was awesome. I had to be part of it. I, I really, really needed to be part of this thing. So I jumped in head first. They were throwing stuff at me. Hey, we're gonna have this guy and he gotta be stuck in barbed wire. I was going, listen, just have the art department go out and get some fake barbed wire that's rubberized and everything else. We'll do the smoke. There was candles, stuff like that and everything. But the cool thing was is just coming up with in a matter of no time at all, with no money at all, as a favor, and because the script grabbed me, even the scene where the little puppet with the rosy cheeks and everything, they put him on a tricycle and they wanted him to ride the tricycle in to the shot. Okay, how are we gonna do this? No time, no money, fishing line. We connected fishing line to the tricycle and pulled it in really slow and his feet were attached to it and he's holding onto the handlebars and it was creepy as hell him just coming in and looking at this thing. Um, 
They actually asked me to build that puppet. I had no time at all. I just threw it to art department and says, have somebody else build this thing. Looking back, I wish I would have done it myself because that thing would be sitting inside my living room right now, along with the reverse bear trap and a bunch of other stuff from the movie. Congratulations, you are still alive. Most people are so ungrateful to be alive, but not you, not anymore. I wanted a movie that had a uh, tonality that kind of permeates throughout everything, right? So um, not just in the way I shot the film, but in the um, production design of the movie, the way it looked, the way it smelled, the way it would taste, the way it sounded. You know, I wanted to create a world that had a, you know, that had a somewhat sort of bleak, um, you know, uh, almost nihilistic quality to it. James definitely had a, an idea what he wanted the film to look like. The main thing was is, is giving each room its own identity. And so we kind of came up with them together. And I pushed the bathroom a little bit because I like to have a backstory to every room. And I didn't want it just to be a bathroom, like a men's or women's room. So we came up with this idea that maybe it was a meat packing company and this was the bathroom that they all washed in after they had been working in this factory. So they probably had blood and guts all over them. Julie became a very close, you know, creative partner of mine. And, uh, and I've always really appreciated what she did for me on Seoul with next to no money, nothing. And she had to like make sets up from out of thin air. And, uh, and I've always appreciated um, how creative and smart she was. I mean, basically we had to shoot all of the environments in, in Lazy Street. And so there was this beautiful metal door that we loved. So we built the bathroom inside this room and we literally used PAs. I, I went to Home Depot, which was literally down the street and would pick up people. Also, they helped us break it down. But it was like a, a rugged group of us um, really doing everything. You know, she really did take what I needed to do in Seoul and she did run with it. She never, you know, she never uh, looked at me and kind of go, oh, I don't know, James, if I can do that. She never, you know, she always stepped up to the plate and she always delivered. You know, there was one, the hallway that they do a chase. We didn't have a hallway there. So I, I put a black duvetine and then textured it with a hopper. And I was like, don't run too fast because you're going to move the duvetine if you do. And weighting it down and then we used work lights to, to light it and then they kept, we didn't have a lighting package so they would take my work lights and use it for lighting and it was, you know, and then they were like, we ran out of time to shoot the hallway and I went to Greg Hoffman, I'm like, you have to go back and shoot that hallway. I worked all weekend on that for free. So they did. <laughs> Jigsaw's lair was, you know, making him an artist and adding elements to his character that maybe didn't come through. The, the barbed wire room, was in the basement, um, which had like this trap door to get down to it. I mean, and it was the real dirt of the floor down there, which now in a million years, they would probably never let me use, you know? And our DP, there was big pipes down there. He hit one of the pipes and knocked himself out. And the operator, the first AC, had to take over for half a day or something like that. I gave him a concussion, basically. And then, there was the room with all of the, um, with the numbers on the walls. So basically it was like all of my crew's like phone numbers and their ex-girlfriend's phone numbers. And so anyways, it was just guerrilla warfare. And um, so those are some of the stories I remember predominantly being like, whoosh, I got out of there without hurting anybody, you know? James and I had no time together in pre-production. He wasn't in the country. So when James got here, he was very, he had some very specific things he wanted to do. He's like, Jigsaw's world, when we see Jigsaw, it always has a green flavor all the way in the background, but not necessarily in the foreground. But the traps, he wanted this strong green tone. 
I was like, okay, we'll take care of that post. We had so little time together, James would be like, okay, I want this shot to just pan into a black screen. And I'd say, okay. I, I didn't know why, I knew he knew why, and he'd say it's just a transition. So it wasn't until I saw the movie that I knew a lot of the transitions we were gonna do. A lot of the film was a trust, and trusting he knew what he wanted, and getting it done. I mean, my, I feel my contribution to the first saw was really about getting it done. It was literally trial by fire, making this film up. I, I, I don't know the guy, and he didn't really know me very well, and we didn't really know each other's sort of methods. It was my first movie, and it was, I think, his first big feature as well. And so we were very fresh to it. Um, but I think just the excitement and the kind of um, energy that we had, right, just really kind of like barreled into the production. You know, we were just flying and running and gunning. We were shooting this movie. It was so, you know, down and dirty. It was very tough. I remember days James would come to the set and we didn't have enough time to shoot everything. Sometimes they would look at him and say, we don't have time to shoot these two scenes. Which one do you want to lose? You know, and I remember days James would just hang his head like, I, I got to figure out which scene to drop here. So it was a bittersweet uh, movie for me in that, um, you know, there were a lot of things that I wanted to do to it that I could not do. I didn't know better at the time that, um, that my vision that I had for the movie um, couldn't, was a lot bigger than the budget and time that I had to work with. And so it really bummed me out in a lot of ways um, when I couldn't get the stuff I wanted. And it was a real struggle to even make my days. We were shooting so many pages a day. I, I cannot remember now how many pages we were trying to rip through. It was just, it was like a, a meat grinder, just pushing it through as fast as we could. We had 18 days, which back then on film is not a lot of time. If I was lucky, I could get maybe two or three takes. If not, it's just one take and I need to move on. And for me at the time, I knew that the movie I want, wanted to tell, I needed lots of coverage and and so, uh, so I didn't really get a lot of coverage and um, so it was a tough film for me to put together in post-production. I don't think I've ever worked on a feature-length film that had less physical footage. I mean, they made the film so quickly that often there, there truly were only one takes, you know, a single take of, of these scenes, which you would think on the one hand, well, that means there's not that much work to do because you don't have that much footage, but no, it's, it becomes, ed editing is, is solving a massive puzzle. It's a giant chess game and you, it's, it's just like having fewer pieces to win your game. <laughs> when you look at Saw, there's a lot of still shots in there, and that was for making up for lack of footage. James and I literally took my 35 millimeter still camera and went downtown and just shot a lot of stuff, and then processed it across the street at whatever, thrifty, brought it back to the cutting room, scanned it, and then did little After Effects montages that look very goofy now, but well, maybe they always look goofy, but they became part of the look of the movies. James called me on his final edit and he said, look, we need some pickup shots, but there's no more money. And I said, well, look, I'm working on a commercial right now. I got some lights and equipment. I got my brother and a van. And James came down with Lee and uh, Eleanor, who is uh, our makeup artist. And we went down to the uh, um, Lacey Street Studios. And we said, we gave the guy a hundred bucks. Can we come in here and shoot? And they said, he said, sure, no problem. He had remembered us. And um, we went in there and did all kinds of pickups. I mean, we were, there's a scene with Shawnee Smith uh, with a knife, but we didn't have a knife. We had my Leatherman. So we shot a shadow of it. So that's why there's a shadow shot of the hand stabbing. And I can't remember if it was Lee or James, but they put it on, painted their uh, fingernails with fingernail polish. So it looked like it was Shawnee's hand. And there's a shot where Lee Wanell had to dress up as um, Danny Glover's uh, partner, wear his clothes walking in through a door. And we just shot from the head down. We had no idea what we're doing. And, and sometimes when I look back, for me, the first saw is cr cringeworthy when it comes to my performance. <laughs> I watch myself on screen and I'm like, oh, you know, that's terrible. You know, I could have done that line so much better. It goes to prove that, you know, sometimes the film doesn't have to be perfect to play perfectly, especially in the genre. We were distracting them with so many times by whip pans and moving them around from time to time, place to place and person to person. I don't think they had time to sit and think about like, 
that was a car chase scene where the car moved five feet. You know, that, that one scene which we argued well, about. It didn't in, move. Right. <laughs> well, we talked about it a lot in post, and we were tinkering, you know, in the edit. And at the end of the day, we talked back and forth and back and forth with how to get more sequence out of that car chase with Danny Glover. And we thought, nobody ever mentioned it. Not once. Right. Because sometimes you tinker, 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 and you should just sit back and let the film sell itself. And, and also James, you know, uh, James obviously uh, such a talented filmmaker and was able to use good old fashioned filmmaking techniques even on a low budget for great effect. For instance, um, how many people think they see Carrie Elwes' yeah. character take the saw and saw all the way through his leg? It's never on screen. Everyone thinks they saw it. For the traps themselves, I think it's very lucky that we established that kinetic montage style because to really try and do a straight edit of almost any of the saw traps would have been a disaster. That's why you get the camera suddenly like doing something really chaotic and having film overexposed flash frames pepper the whole thing. The fact is that was the only way that they could be cut because there just wasn't footage. My lawyer, who I'd been with for many years, said that he'd come, there was these guys that had this indie horror movie that were using a bunch of my remixes and excerpts from Nine Inch Nails songs and all this other stuff that I'd had some involvement with in their temp score for this horror movie they were putting together, and that I should call these guys up immediately. Went and met with James and Lee and saw the first cut of the movie and was working on it by dinner time that day. And, you know, it was obvious from seeing the music they had put into the temp that they were open to uh, a lot of experimentation in the score and that they didn't want sort of uh, classic horror movie kind of orchestral stuff or even the sort of John Carpenter thing with sort of synthesizers and drum machines playing ominous themes. They wanted something even to the left of all of that. I wanted a score that was beautiful and melodic at the same time, but then when chaos starts to go, you know, starts to, at the end of the movie starts to barrel out of hand, I really wanted the um, music score to kind of represent that as well, represent the state of mind that my characters were in. But then when the ending of the movie came, the theme of the movie came back into it again. It came back in to tie everything up and show that, um, that the controlling nature of the film did not belong to these two lead characters, it belonged to this puppet master. What attracts me to this genre is the, you know, it's very possible to use some very extreme sounds in context of the music in a horror genre, probably much more so than would work in other genres that I'm also a fan of. But in the horror genre, you can get away with a lot of pretty destructive sound design techniques in the context of the score. And the great thing for us is, again, is we owned it. So most guys that go work, if you go score a TV show or a movie, the studio owns it. They don't really give you, so we're like, hey, we'll just own it with you. So you got to own all his masters, got to own the publishing, and it's become an incredible profit source for him, is that people use, the, there's a certain sting you know, da -na -na, na -na, that Ridley Scott's used, Tony Scott's used, it's been a um, lot of Sydney, I think Sidney Pollock used. So in movies, they use our uh, our music all the time. We wouldn't make one with a, a Saw movie ever without him. The, the traps in the first film were a very small element. The meat of that film was these two guys stuck in the bathroom. And to me it was like this little locked room thriller, it was a real puzzle. I loved the non-linear puzzle element of the first Saw film that all led up to this twist ending. That's what I loved. He 
the original Saw is one of the greatest twist endings of all time. You can make a short list of the movies that have the greatest twist endings, and it's uh, the original Planet of the Apes, it's Sixth Sense, it's Usual Suspects, it's Saw. That's that's adjacentism, right? Because it doesn't have a wordplay, but no. it's like this, you know, this statement that sounds true even if it's not. No, there's an undercurrent of hyperbole that exactly. is completely you. It's exactly. There's a man in the room with you. When there's that much poison in your blood, the only thing left to do is shoot yourself. Well, if you ask me why I did that film, uh, there were multiple reasons. And uh, uh, the story, I, I was like, three guys locked in a bathroom? Well, that's so, uh, it's waiting for Godot. I mean, who, who, makes, who makes a movie about three guys locked in a bathroom? Number one. Number two, I had never worked with Danny Glover. And I wanted to do that. Number three, when I got to the moment when he gets up from the floor in the script, I had not anticipated that moment. So I thought, if they shoot this moment well, it's gonna be a fabulous moment. Tobin Bell, what a trooper. I mean, he comes in, just worked eight days, and I think he spent seven and a half days lying on a dirty floor pretending to be dead. We told him he didn't have to do it. We were gonna build a model, you know, a dummy, and he said, no, that's not right. I was on the floor the whole time. If you saw any piece of me, whether it was my foot or a hand, it, it all had to do with the framing. Because other than that, and him standing, we had some, you know, some of the shots of him in a hospital, some early stuff like that. But outside of, so he had a day, maybe a day or two of acting, and was on the floor for six days, just laying there. And so he's, he was laying there during all those scenes, and he's the guy who, of course, stood up at the end and blew everybody's minds. Although he was probably the only one not complaining. We only had 17 days. Yeah. <laughs> Key to that chain is in the bathtub. That moment was only as good as it was because of Lee's reaction. Lee's reaction is huge in that moment. It's so truthful and so well done that um, that's what sold the moment. It's not like a, a, a great Shakespearean actor is required for that role, you know? We just got so lucky, it was just so fortuitous that someone who was such a great performer happened to be cast in that role, because then as his role grew more prominent in the sequels, he really took on this character and is kind of like the, you know, a Freddy Krueger for this new generation. You felt his presence every, everywhere in the movie, but you barely see him because in, in a large way, Saw was designed as a whodunit movie, right? And so like a lot of time, it, part of the fun of Saw, and I think part of the reason why it played as well as it did, was you're trying to guess who the bad guy is. And, and so all you really have, you know, um, is the personality that comes across through his vocal performance. I think the reason that uh, Tobin's Jigsaw, you know, has resonated with audiences is that James and Lee, having gone to Melbourne Film School, were real uh, students of film, and they spent hours and hours studying the classic horror films that have all these incredible iconic bad guys, and they, they were determined to come up with their own iconic bad guy. When I was casting this and I was thinking about Toby, I really harked back to um, how Orson Welles used to cast his movies, which was um, he didn't watch the actors, he would close his eyes or he would look away and he would only listen to them. And he would pick his actors on the sound and the tonality and the kind of um, texture and quality that he would get from hearing the actors speak through their voices. And that was something that I was very mindful of when casting Tobin. The cigarettes are harmless, I promise. Smoking is only poisonous when it ends in bloodshed. If you can do a horror film and create the sensation for the viewer of, um, of character and relationship, in addition to the scary moments and the technical effects and all of that kind of thing, then you've got some, I think you've got something because you can accomplish as much in the horror genre with good writing as you can in any other genre. Live or die.
options. Make your choice. What happened is, is we basically did a video deal. And what happened is, is we went to Sundance and through word of mouth and buzz, we had three sold out midnight showings. Now you're in a situation where, you know, you kind of think you know what you have, but you also are so used to seeing the film. You've read the script, you've worked through all the cuts, you kind of know, you know, how things are going to turn out. You have no idea how it's going to work for fresh eyes. And then you find out that the first time you're going to find that out is, of all places, Sundance, which could be the greatest situation in the world, or it could immediately tell you that, you know, all the time you've spent and all the, uh, the enthusiasm you, you've invested, you know, hasn't been good use of time. But here we were all of a sudden, and we're going to play Sundance, and we're going to play at the Egyptian. And the Egyptian theater, on top of that, has a long history of some of the great horror movies having their world premiere there. Uh, movies like Blair Witch Project, uh, The Descent. So you, so you have you have a lot of buildup to a movie unveiling for the first time Midnight Section Egyptian Theater at Sundance, and to be able to watch an audience discover this film for the very first time, a film that you know since we've been working on it so much, we knew intimately. Like you know, we knew the twist ending was coming before the movie even starts. So to watch an audience take it in and to have that. That have the very first audience have those kind of reactions, it was incredible. After Sundance, Lionsgate did a recruited audience screening uh, of the movie at a local Cineplex, and the movie played like a rock concert. It scored through the roof. It tested so well, they didn't believe us. They thought we rigged the test. And now we really had a decision to make. Are we going to push a lot of money through it, or do we really need to find out whether it was true or not? And, and, and so that was where the idea of the second test came from. And so the first one had been in Chatsworth, California. The second one we go out of town to Las Vegas, Nevada to do a, another recruited audience screening for Saw. And the most extraordinary thing occurs that not only did Saw uh, test the same way it did in Chatsworth, it actually tested higher. So it scores even better uh, in its second test screening and that was really the tipping point moment in all of the discussions at Lionsgate of a film that when we originally acquired it, a lot of people thought, you know what, this is, this is most likely going to be a direct-to-home video movie. Suddenly, um, that second test screening, the discussion really becomes, you know what, this could be a wide-release film for us. And that was a game-changer. Tim Palin at, in the marketing department um, at Lionsgate saw saw and it inspired him in pretty crazy ways he, he's done a lot of the advertising um, photography himself he's a master photographer and so they saw the potential of doing a dirty black and white picture of a severed foot or a hand with missing fingers or whatever uh, and that really made the franchise when the first movie came out we didn't know for sure if it was going to find an audience and we all loved it. I thought it was the coolest movie I'd seen since Seven. And, but you never know if, if a movie like that is going to find its audience and if the studio is going to promote it in a way that gets it to where it needs to be. So we didn't know. We weren't going into the Olympics saying nothing but gold will do. We were going into the Olympics saying it'd be nice to get bronze. That was our attitude. Um, to then win the gold medal, to have the film come out in theatres and do well was just way beyond what we ever dreamed of. I guess I was relieved more than anything, you know, that, uh, that, um, that even with, you know, all the things I didn't get, people still liked the film. And, um, and so I kind of look at that now and just go, you know what, you know, it is what it is. Um, if, if I had more money and more time to do it, I don't know if the film would have being the final film that it was, that people seem to have come, gone, gone to love. So, you know, things happen for a reason, I guess. Greg was really the person on the ground doing the work, a big chunk of the work every day. I mean, without Greg, we wouldn't be sitting here. The fact that uh, Greg gave us our first big opportunity of this big break Greg was also such a great guy and um, and uh, and even up to today you know it's hard to talk about the Saw films and the Saw world 
without Greg's name coming up because he was so instrumental to the success of the Soul films. And, you know, and we all just love him as a human being. He shepherdeered the whole thing. He put everyone together. He was the backbone of it getting made, really. He actually helped make my career. He went to the studios for me for Dead Silence when they were like, she's never done a studio picture and we don't know if she can do it. And he helped me put a presentation together and went in with me when like 12 people at a boardroom table. Greg was kind of, you know, just hugging me and being like, you can do it. If you throw a stick in Los Angeles, you'll hit somebody who has a horror story about a producer. What luck we had to meet somebody who was such a gentleman, such a nice guy who guided us through. And once again, could have been pointing the finger at us and saying, you guys don't know what you're doing. I do, follow me. He never did that. He let James make the film he wanted to make. I saw him on a Friday night with Oren and Mark, and he said, he said, we're doing Saw 3 and we're a go. And unfortunately, Greg died two days later, which was the biggest loss. He was the kindest, kindest, caring guy you'd ever want to meet. Part of the reason that, um, that Lionsgate and Mark and Oren were very um, instrumental in making sure that, um, that the Saw sequels um, kept up their theatrical quality uh, in a lot of ways was to basically pay tribute to Greg and, uh, and, and I'm very fortunate um, to, have been, uh, to have known Greg while he was around. This is two weeks before he died. Mark and I, in thanks for him uh, taking care of some business for us, we bought him a new Maserati. And this, this is his two, dream car. His dream car. And we went with Mike Dunleavy, who was coaching the Clippers at the time, and some other friends, and we went to uh, and oh, Surprised him. With surprised him. him. We took his old car, and so gave the valet ticket, and the valet brought this car back. And that's why he's signing the paperwork right there in this picture. Obviously, as we all know now, Saw went on to create a subgenre in the horror world, and it's a subgenre that um, you know that critics have kind of frowned upon in in a lot of ways. I think when I hear, hear the term torture porn, it has a positive effect on me. It makes me think of all these great things that happened in my life. As a term, I think it's just something that the media comes up with for a shorthand. You know, I've worked for magazines before, and you're always looking for shorthand, like what's the most direct way to somebody's into somebody's conscious, you know. In the same way a term like grunge or, you know, whatever you're talking about, it's, it's something that you can use to symbolize something and instantly get the message across. Blank porn is a very popular term now and it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with pornography. It just has to do with something that you get really into, you know, it's just a, an, an emphasis. But I think a lot of people when they would hear about the Saw films and that they're torture porn, they assume that it's very sexual. We always hated the idea of torture porn as a phrase that they were using. I mean, I think that when it happens on a celebrated TV show like Homeland, you know, nobody cares and they say it's realistic. When it happens on American Horror Story, they say that's really creative and inventive. It was very funny because when I went to make Hostel, Hostel was originally a Sony movie and they saw the dailies and they're like, this is so insane and violent. We want to, we need to bring in Lionsgate to help release it domestic. So Lionsgate comes in and they saw Hostel and they went, well, this is too violent. And I said, well, what about Saw? That's, uh, they're like, yeah, but I don't know, this is too much. And then Saw 2 is a big hit. And they, were, they, and they said, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll release Hostel. So in a crazy way, Cabin Fever felt, helped Saw. And then the Saw movies were, gave Lionsgate, you know, the, the courage to release Hostel. But then after Hostel comes out, this article comes out in the New York Magazine about torture porn and suddenly everything we did, Saw wasn't a thriller, Hostel wasn't a horror movie, everything was torture porn. We were working at a time where, coming out of the 90s, where all movies were so, not bad, but not efficient anymore. They were just like very plain, uh, um, you know, like a high school slasher movie, you know, like I Know What You Did Last Summer, or, or all those like movies were just not as efficient of Texas Chainsaw Massacre or The Last House on the Left or 
uh, uh, Deliverance or Straw Dogs or Maniac, they were just very soft and very, uh, uh, they were not visceral. They were not like getting you in your gut and making you feel that you were like going to hell when you were watching the movie. We just wanted to inject like a shot of reanimator fluid into the horror genre. And you could feel it with Greg McLean, Neil Marshall, Alex Aja, Rob Zombie, you know, and obviously James and Lee, like in Darren Bowsman. Like we just wanted to get in there and shake things up. And looking back years later, you know, I feel like we really did. I don't follow trends. I don't think that's how you should make your film. I think you should just make your movie like you would any other kind of genres, right? Just make the film, make this, t tell the story you want to tell and see what happens, you know? And, uh, and I always use myself as a gauge. I just make the movies that I want to see myself. And, uh, and hopefully other people out there would feel the same way. I hope like, you know, like, a filmmaker will be creative enough to keep reinventing the genre because all movies need to be reinvented every time. Like, people get used of the formula. They know that at the end of the corridor, when the music rays, something's gonna happen. They know, like, the payoff is gonna come. They know it's gonna be a jump, it's gonna be, like, something graphic, or. So you have to reinvent that grammar all the time if you want to keep the, uh, the efficiency of the, the filmmaking. What was most exciting to us was that we felt like we were part of a wave, that we just loved horror movies, we missed a certain type of movie, and we went out to change things. And we, everybody had very personal movies. They're like, no one was adapting things, no one was remaking things. Everyone just had an idea for something that had to get out of them. And we all really supported each other. You have to die. No, I wanna live! I wanna I'm live! sorry. I wanna live! My family. <laughs> Saw is one of the films, one of the few key films that has influenced an entire generation of filmmakers. When you make a movie now after Saw, if you're especially within the genre, you are either imitating it, you're responding to it, you're reacting against it, you're trying to top it, or you're paying homage to it. I love the Saw fans. With Saw, you could go anywhere in the world and connect with people over that film. When we were making the film, we had no idea that it would become the success that it became. We, we made the film in 18 days on a budget of a million dollars. And um, I think we were all hoping just to make our money back, actually. <laughs> we had no idea it would end up uh, making a hundred million dollars and spawn the, the most successful horror franchise in cinema history. Don't, don't worry, I'll bring someone back. I promise. I still get tweets from kids across the world, you know. I'll get these tweets from Holland in broken English, you know. Please be to write me. I'll be loving Saw. And it just, it amazes me that to this day it still has impact and I really love the fans of Saw. They made it what it is. They built it up. I've sat at conventions and seen kids come up to me with homemade props from the film. The franchise and the characters and the legend of Jigsaw and Saw belongs to them now. And so if anybody out there becomes inspired by seeing Saw and makes a great horror film that I enjoy, that's the best possible result of this whole thing. People call John Kramer an icon or Jigsaw an icon, you know, I don't have any control over that sort of thing and nor do I ever think about that. I just continue as an actor to try to make characters as interesting as they possibly can be. And to reach out and make people say, oh, I recognize that, or I can identify with that. I somehow touch them in some way. I think a really big moment for me when I felt like Saw had really penetrated the public consciousness was when, uh, the Sopranos made a reference to it because I was such a big fan of The Sopranos. And they actually mentioned Saw by name. Chris was like, we got to make a fucking movie like this Saw movie. <laughs> and it just knocked me off my chair. You know, in the, the Adult Swim series in Robot Chicken, they did a takeoff on Saw. And even on Aqua Teen Hunger Force, there was a, an episode that they referred to it as well. 
And it's just amazing to see something that came from, I, I guess you could say, humble origins turn into something that's permeated the pop culture consciousness to such a degree that it's referred to in completely separate venues. Saw became part of pop culture. Saw became an annual uh, event at Comic-Con every year. A roller coaster uh, based on Saw was created in the UK. There's tons of uh, models and miniatures and tchotchkes and basically um, Saw became part of the pop culture zeitgeist in a way that none of us could have possibly imagined when that first film was being made. As I was walking down the street coming here today, two guys in trucks, two separate trucks stopped guys going, whoa, hey, hey, love your movies, man, love your movies, you know. So it's always, it's always uh, heartwarming uh, that, you know, you, you do what you do on, on a 60-foot screen and you, you end up in people's consciousness. There's a part of me that's always a little surprised about how big it is. I mean, it's in the Guinness Book of World Records as the largest horror grossing franchise in history. The way we made the first one, you know, the way I made the first one with James was like some friends got together and we went into my garage with a Super 8 camera. It made my career. It's introduced me into directing, uh, gave me a place, I guess, in film history. Never even thought I'd ever say that. It's, it's kind of cool to be part of such an amazing franchise that, that's helping a genre grow and actually, I think, really help the movie industry create this kind of smaller guerrilla warfare films that, that um, are grungy and that helped a lot of career building. The Saab series absolutely changed my life. It made me both an editor and a director. So uh, it, overall, it was a fantastic experience. Working on the original Saw kinda is like wearing a badge of honor. I've worked with some of the biggest actors and I've done some huge effects, big explosions, giant explosions, even won awards for them and stuff. But being on the other end of that, to be able to say, and I did the movie Saw, I did all the torture devices for the movie Saw, the reputation that Saw has is, it was a great movie for a micro budget. So if you could do a great movie for a micro budget, that's a whole nother badge to wear on you. You can never start out with something and say, I wanna make something great, you know? That's why I love the inception of this film, that it came out of these simple confines of, we wanna make a movie, we have no money. What can we afford? We can afford two guys in a room. And then they got creative and inventive and imaginative. Looking back, we were the shepherds of the, the franchise along with Peter Block and Jason Constantine, but it, it all started with Lee wan -El and James Wan in a, a, a dream in Melbourne, Australia. The great thing about the Saw franchise and Saw itself is this is really about two guys who just really wanted to make a movie. And, and, and I truly believe that if we hadn't stepped in and if Mark and Orton hadn't, and Greg hadn't stepped in, James and Lee would have made this movie anyway. We'd have all watched it and said, <laughs> what a great movie. Why didn't we make it? And, and, you, and you have to really respect their vision. I mean, here they are. These are two film students in Australia and uh, couldn't be further away from Hollywood uh, than uh, geographically than Australia in many ways. And, uh, and they're making a short film, they're writing a screenplay on spec, and they have dreams of doing what they are now doing, and they followed through and made it happen. My favorite memory of making the film was really working with Lee and James. Um, they were so incredibly passionate, and, uh, and they made what could have been a very morose and depressing <laughs> film <laughs> with us chained to the wall for the most part. Uh, really uh, uh, somber, but they made it fun. They made it fun. And they're two kids from Melbourne, Australia, you know, right out of film school, and they, they were just like kids in a candy store. Uh, they were really enjoying the journey, um, and it was a joy to watch them. You know, James and I, we, we achieved our dream. Like, we, 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 we had that great moment that, unfortunately, a lot of people don't get to have, where, which is where your life's dream comes true. And I remember Mark Berg saying to me, you know, who's, who's still a friend of mine to this day, I remember him saying to me back then, you know, it'll never be this way again. And he was right. 
because, you know, I realize that it, it's probably never going to be that good again. It's a shame that our best experience was our first experience because it's all downhill from here. <laughs> and we have had great times making other films, James and I, but I think that Saw is just so special um, in so many ways, not just because it was our first movie, but because we were surrounded by people who, would, who just had so much love. The first movie now, in hindsight, feels so different to the rest of to, to where Saw eventually became. The rest of the Saw films actually became really, really fast-paced and, uh, and and have a lot of things happening, um, whereas the first Saw films actually pretty, pretty low-key in a lot of respect. Um, you know, uh, I had a friend that pointed out to me that uh, that he felt the first Saw film actually felt very minimalistic in a lot of ways, which uh, which was very interesting to to hear. Uh, to hear Saw be described as a sort of almost avant-garde type horror film now. So I think it'd be interesting to see, you know, a new generation discovering the very first movie I made. Game over. Ah!